Hello, welcome to the Vulcan Bomber Simulator Experience. This video is going to explain exactly what it would have been like to fly the Vulcan Bomber. You see a lot of documentaries about the Vulcan Bomber, but this will give you a perspective on what it was actually like to fly this legendary aircraft. We'll be doing a couple of takeoffs, some low level flying, some formation flying, and some landings. But unfortunately, the audio quality isn't brilliant, so I've added subtitles in. And for that reason, I'm going to make this video into numerous parts just as I go through and write out all the subtitles. Please watch the final one for the 737 simulator and uh, check out the comments below because I'll be putting links into Vulcan Bomber documentaries and really interesting facts about the Vulcan Bomber in the description box below the video. I hope you enjoy it. Watch this space because more Vulcan Bomber Simulator videos will be coming out as I manage to get through the footage. Creation of the uh, quick readiness alert room. So when the uh, when the Vulcans were um, carrying nuclear weapons during the Cold War, mm. then uh, they had a number of them on 24-hour standby, and um, they were all fueled up and bombed up and ready to go. All yeah. the systems running, so the, the Max would keep them running, and then pilots would come in here or crew members would come in here, and uh, they'd spend uh, probably up to about eight hours trying to pass the time, hoping that the phone didn't ring. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> And then they would replace, be replaced by another crew and so on. 
So you always had 24 hour cover yeah. with these aircraft. Because of course, if they got the phone call, it meant they were off to bomb Russia and then they'd be coming um, back to nothing. Yeah, each aircraft was basically assigned a city. Yeah. Yeah. So you're Leningrad, you're Moscow, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, the deal was if the phone rang, they had four minutes to be airborne. Yeah. So as you imagine, getting a four engine bomber up and running in four minutes takes a bit of doing. So they had to rehearse that again and again. Yeah. Um, one of the ways they achieved it was by rigging up the aircraft with multiple ground power units and air starters so you could start all four engines at the same time. It's not the way they normally like to start the aircraft, they do it in the more conventional one at a time way. Mm -hmm. But if it was a scramble, then you know, needs must. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but it was rehearsed many times. <clears throat> so this is the only Vulcan simulator in the world. It is, it is. We had a lot of help from uh, the Avro Heritage Centre, do you know, uh, they're at Woodford. Yeah, I've heard of that, yeah. Yeah, it's worth Because they were keeping the Vulcan visit. bomber going, weren't they? But now they're running out of money for it, so. Yeah, yeah, well, it was two years ago they stopped flying that last one. But, uh, mm. uh, Woodford is where they used to build a lot of them. Uh, it's no longer an airfield. It's just south of Manchester Airport. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've ripped up the runway, they're building hundreds of houses now. Yeah, but what used good. to be the fire station when it was a, an active airfield is now the Avro Heritage Centre. Yeah. So if ever you're down that way, it's worth a, worth a look. Yeah. They've got uh, Vulcan parked outside, mm -hmm. and that's painted up white, you know, the original anti-nuclear yeah. anti flash type colour scheme. And um, Anti-nuclear flash? Well, when the nuclear white. flash went off, you know, this, this, <coughs> this white, white colour scheme was... Uh, when I was the aircraft. Prominent. Yeah. Right. When I was a lad, because uh, we lived from Hull, you know, I remember driving with my father, he drove past the I remember, I remember it's an image you got in my mind, seeing all these fucking bombers parked on the, on yeah. the all white. Yeah, that's it. Brilliant. And I actually remember at home once, I actually saw three of them flying over in formation, just like big swans in the sky. Fabulous. Yeah.
impressive about it. Those air brakes are incredibly effective. Uh, and when we're getting the aircraft down, let's just do a half roll like this. Then pull, get it coming down vertically. Air brake out. Well, now oh, yeah, it's spinning right now, yeah. And now you've got something like 8,000 gigabit coming down. What you have to remember, of course, is a lot of inertia to overcome. So you need to anticipate when to pull out of the dive. Then coming down to 6,000 feet now. 5,000 now. Off the start line. There we go. So we're going over the Lake District at some point. Well, we're over the wash at the moment, so we could touch a little bit of low flying here just for now. So to get below enemy radar, it needs to be ideally about no more than 200 feet along the ground. Yeah. 200 feet. Okay, let's do that. Now when I was doing that in Valley, didn't have a radio altimeter on the horn. So, and I'm not making this up now, to judge your height, if you can see legs on cows, you're about 500 feet up. Right, yeah. If you can see legs <laughs> on sheep, you're 200 feet up. Right, so going down the Welsh Valley, we're looking for sheep's legs. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's just take it on down. This is plenty of sheep in Wales, so you want to know. Well, that's true. Very good altimeter. Also, you said it was all looking out the window for obvious reasons. You can look in because at that height, they just had to concentrate 100% on the outside view. 1,000 feet. 500, 800 the radio altimeter. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you look out the side, you get a real impression of speed. We're doing 400 knots, about 7, 7 miles a day. You generally flew in knots of 60 to make the maths easy. So 420 knots, 7 miles a minute. Yeah. You fly for 10 minutes on this heading. Therefore, you know, I know how many miles I've done. Didn't have any terrain following radar or anything. It's all by eye. No, that's right. Well, the other thing was, relatively just you go up and down and sit through the ground when it's relatively flat. Come up to yeah, a hill. Yeah. Easy to pull up this side of the hill. You then couldn't push hard to stay low as you go over the top because you get negative G, which would starve the engines. The blood would rush to your head, so you'd get red out. Yeah. So there was a little trick used to do. They did this at home as well. So if you imagine me coming up to the hill where this road is, as you got to the peak, you then take the airplane beyond the vertical. Now the nose is pointing at the ground, and you're having to pull positive to stop it spinning in. That way you stay low and you keep positive geo. The downside being your wingtips only about 80 feet up high. Right. You can't see them at all, can you? So you have to know where they are. Unless you have your navigator behind you, moaning like mad, saying, I gave you a heading to steer for the target. You see, yeah, well, I'm a bit busy right now. <laughs> So have a bit of fun with the low flying, take this off to the left of there. That's the way. Lovely. I'll oh, put on a bit more speed down there. How far to the left do you want to be? So let's go in further. Uh, not to really far off. And we can see it right there. We'll go and meet up at F. Which airfield says Doncaster, isn't it? 